Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Tech Tactics Live. Tonight, we're episode 28, and we're going to be talking about why you should buy this car. This is a 991.1911. Uh, we're talking model US model years 2012 to 2016. Before we get into that, just a little bit of housekeeping. Be sure to like and subscribe. And for those of you that are watching with us live tonight, be sure to comment in the live chat area because we've got some great prizes for you uh, provided by our partners at Pelican Parts. First prize is going to be a Porsche Sunshade that fits your car, about a $90 value. Then we've got um, Esco Heavy Duty Jack Stands that you can choose uh, whichever style you like for your Porsche. And we'll be giving those away, uh, a pair of those, to, uh, to the second winner. Um, Let's see, we wanna thank Pirelli, our sponsors of Tech Tactics Live, so be sure if you ever see them out at events, thank them for supporting the show. Without them, we couldn't do it. We're on the 28th episode, and we've got some, some folks back on. In fact, our first guest, uh, fourth time, and a favorite of ours on Tech Tactics Live, that's Nathan Mers, PCA Tech Committee member, but also owner of Columbia Valley Luxury Cars. And then my favorite editor, <laughs> second time on Tech Tactics Live, Rob Sass, editor of Porsche Panorama. You, you see what I, what I did there, right? Um, yeah. And tonight's car, we have this beautiful 2013 um, 991 and uh, brought to us by uh, local PCA Chesapeake region member, John Lewis. John, thank you so much uh, for bringing the car. Um, let's. Let's kind of hit on the agenda real quick, if you don't mind, so you guys know what we're gonna be talking about. What's it like to live with a 991? Why to choose a 991 over a 997? What Chris Harris, for those of you that know who Chris Harris is, uh, picked for a 991? What can go wrong? Uh, we checked in with Peter Smith, our favorite Goldmeister tech, and he gave us some uh, intel on the 991. Uh, we, we're going to take a little walk around uh, this cabriolet and maybe uh, Nathan and Rob can share with us some experience they have with um, looking at a car like this. And uh, we're going to look at options that you might want to consider and some that you might want to avoid. And then we're going to wrap up the show with special edition 991, which there aren't that many, but there are definitely some worthy of uh, taking note. So it's hard to believe that 991's really been around for just about a decade. Um, and I'll, I'll just throw it over to John. Now, John was smart. He didn't wait till 2020 to go looking for his 991 because those of you that have been looking for a 991.1 probably have noticed the market is pretty tight for these cars. Um, John, I'm just gonna walk over so we can hang out. Um, you bought this in 2016 as a CPO car? Correct. So what made you decide on the 991? What, what kind of sports car were you in prior to this car? So my wife and I had a five series, uh, okay. four door. Um, we enjoyed it, uh, but it was getting a little old and we were driving down the road one day and we saw a 911. And uh, I told my wife, I said, I've always wanted a 911. And uh, she said, uh, well, let's, let's start looking around and see, see what's available. Now, did you plan on 997 versus 991? Like, did you know the decade or the model style? No, I really didn't. We just wanted to find something that was a nice balance of uh, availability. And she said there were two rules. It had to be a convertible and it had to be an automatic. Okay. So and this car is a PDK version. Car. It is. Okay. So you bought it. It's a, 2000, it's a 2013, you bought it in 2016, so I assume that the car was a certified pre-owned CPO car. It was. It had original uh, warranty that was still good, but we decided to add on additional warranties for an eight-year total uh, warranty coverage. And, and that's smart. I think uh, CPO is probably one of the best ways to buy a Porsche because someone else has taken the depreciation hit. Most Porsche owners have taken care of their car, mm -hmm. and the warranty is very good with just the standard CPO, but then when you have the uh, option to extend it even further, then you have that peace of mind because these are pretty complex vehicles. And, and should something happen, let's say the PDK or the infotainment system, it's nice to have that sort of security blanket, right? It is. Unfortunately, we haven't needed to use it at all. 
uh, which is a good After thing. I said all of that, <laughs> <laughs> after I said about it's, CPO. <laughs> uh, but, okay, well, it's just like the snowblower, right? You, you bring out the right. snowblower, yeah, for sure. and if you bring it out, you, you won't need it. But if you don't, then something happens. So it's just, it's, it's like insurance. Peace of mind. Peace of mind, exactly. Absolutely. Well, sure. thank you so much for bringing the car. We're going to jump over to Nathan and Rob and, and get on with the show here. So 991 over 997, you know, this car has been around about a decade. I think if I remember correctly, what was really unique about the 991 coming out was it was a rare, a rare, I guess, technological feat when they made the metals and the composites and all that stuff for this car. The next generation car was lighter than the than the 997. Am I correct with that? I think it was about 100 pounds heavier. And I think the surprise was you know, it grew in size. Like the wheelbase is like two and a half inches uh, longer. It's wider. Um, and it appears to be a larger car just to a casual observer. But I think that through the use of high strength steel and aluminum, they kept the weight, you know, pretty close to to what the 997 was. Yeah, it's like it stayed around 3,000 pounds or so. 3,150. Okay. You know, under around 3,200, I think, for a base Carrera, which is pretty good considering it's a, you know, it's a an, the next size up from a 997. Yeah. Well, certainly it's it's a gorgeous car. This car here is a um, dark blue metallic over a tan. Um, Nathan, you've driven 997s and, and 991s. What do you think are the major differences between the two? Well, I think the, the biggest thing about the 991 is the 991, 991 is the first, I would call, a hard break in the development of the water-cooled car, starting with the 996. So if, if you look at the 996 and the first generation 997 and second generation 997, well, there's certainly a big visual difference between a 996 and a 997. From a driving dynamic standpoint, they're very related. And, and what I would tell people is there's maybe a 10% improvement in the driving dynamic between each of those models. And the jump between that and the 991 is a, a, a massive jump on almost all metrics uh, because it's a completely clean sheet platform. So um, it's one of the cars where it drives notably different than a 997.2. Whereas, for example, if you drove a 997.1 and then drove a .2, you would tell they're very much related and very, very similar. The .2 has some refinements, but it's not a radical change. The jump from a .2 997 to the 991 .1 is a pretty big leap forward, in my opinion, in terms of the absolute performance envelope. And then some of the things like noise, vibration, harshness, um, those areas, it improved. Of course, it's hotly debated about, you know, when you talk sports car and we talk Porsche, you know, what's a quote improvement? And we all mm -hmm. debate about that. Mm -hmm. So we can we can delve into that more. But from a strictly objective measure, leaving the emotion aside, uh, it is an improvement across basically every performance metric. Yeah. And if you look at the stats on a on a, a base 991 or 991S comparing it to the GT3 of the 997, like it's pretty staggering how much performance is in the the standard and the S model from the very beginning. Um, I, I did notice when, when I, I drove the 991 for the first time is as you just walk up to it, it is, is it a, it's a big car, right? Yeah. But the performance envelope is there. The graphic, it's actually, the wheelbase is actually almost four inches longer, yeah. uh, not three inches than, than the 997. So yeah, I mean, it's visually another size up from, from the 997, which Nathan, you would know uh, probably better than I would, but I think they actually, you know, the doors, roof, and everything were common from the 996 to the 997. Didn't they actually share some body panels? And that was not they the case. They did. So, yeah, I mean, 991, other than the badge on the hood and the general concept of a rear engine Porsche, I don't believe anything is shared. It's all new platform. And, and, and it does drive nice. Now, here's some would complain, I would say. Maybe complain is a strong word, but as these cars go into the next generation you know i come from g body car to 993 to 996 997 like they all seem to just continually to be inflated and get bigger and yes more refined but some would say that it's less raw what do you think about those that say that i think, well, they, I think they're correct 
I think I'm sorry. What Nathan said earlier that the, the NVH isolation in a 991 is is several orders of magnitude better than a 997. You know, I think it also highly depends on you have to make sure you have an apples to apples comparison because, of course, within every platform there's a huge range. And so, you know, if you were comparing a, a base 997 to PDK on 18 inch wheels to a 991 GTS, well, of course, you really can't say that's a platform difference that's how that particular model is spec'd out so you have to kind of make sure you're you're having a conversation about you know how does a base carrera 997.2 compared to a base carrera 991.1 feel so make sure you're as, as even as possible and in that segment um certainly i think most people will agree as cars have uh, gotten better technologically and the engineers have figured out how to almost perfect the art of of building a car it needs less and less from the driver. Mm -hmm. And so when the car needs less from you as a driver, it allows you to check out and do other things, which the average driver, frankly, appreciates, maybe isn't the safest mode. Uh, but for a driving enthusiast, we want as much interaction as possible with our car, mm -hmm. right? So when the, when the new car takes that away from us, we feel a little bit let down, even though it's technically, quote, a better car, right? Yeah, and and having been been able to drive this car or a car similar to this on track, like it really is amazing how I'm an okay driver, but on track with you know compared to a a earlier model and, uh, or a, even 996 to to this, this car is so capable and so predictable and so stable. Um, you know, it's just amazing how, how technology just make sure you're able to do things on the track that you weren't really able to do before. And maybe it kind of masks some of what you need to learn, but at the end of the day, you're, 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 you're much more confident on the track and, or on the street for that matter. I also think I always tell people when I talk to people that are making a decision about which 911 is the right fit for them, we always talk a lot about what is it they're wanting to use the car for? Mm -hmm. So for example, like in my life, if I needed a, a Porsche to be my one and only everyday car, I would probably go as modern as possible. And so a 991 would fit that realm. Um, but if I'm using it as strictly a Sunday day, you know, just cars and coffee, go out for a two lane road drive, well, then maybe my choice might look a little different. So a lot of it depends on how you need the car to function and what you're trying to accomplish with it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So let's talk about why we've kind of laser focused on to the dot one cars and for me it has to do with maybe the lack of turbos this is a this as a standard car is a three four is it a three four or three six i think it's a three four and three, then four for the base three four yeah. right and then the the s is a th three eight three eight three eight yeah so um you know once you get past 2016 then you get the introduction of the six-cylinder turbo cars in the 911, which is an amazing power plant, but especially on, say, like a 16 or 15 911 GTS at full tilt, man, that is a soundtrack that is like no other. And yeah. regardless of power, torque, or whatever, like the symphony that comes out of your exhaust. Yeah, I happen amazing. to be a big fan of the three-liter turbo exhaust sound. Of the, Com the but compared two. compared to the naturally aspirated that's coming out of a 991.1, yeah. it's a good soundtrack, but it's not the same yeah. soundtrack. Fair enough. Well, there's got to be a crazy guy in every bunch booth, so we're going to excuse Rob on that one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I actually, I, I, I really like the Dot 2 cars, and I like that power plant, uh, but hands down, I, I'm sorry, Rob, you cannot say that there's a better oh, was, sound. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying it's a yeah. bad yeah. motor. I'm not no, saying it's a bad exhaust tune. I'm just saying the uh, 15, the naturally aspirated motor just sounds right. and amazing. I, wasn't saying I prefer it. I was just saying that it's it's not bad by any means. I just oh yeah. no yeah. Not so please, if you own a later one with turbos, don't be <laughs> mad at me. I'm not saying you have a bad soundtrack on your car. I'm just yeah. saying I really like this soundtrack. Yeah. But um, you know that that's also evolution. Why do you think the that the 911 went to turbos, um, you know, after 2016. Do you think it was an emissions thing? It was efficiency. I mean, I've driven the later models as well, and 
there's like no, I don't, I don't feel any turbo lag. They're amazing power plant and they've got tons of torque. So as a motor, it's awesome. Um, but why do you think they kind of went into turbo? So now even a, a standard, standard 911 and a 911S, although they are not, they are all turbos, but they're not called turbos, right? So it's kind of yeah. a whole crazy naming thing. Why do you think they went to turbos? It's a hundred percent fuel economy. I mean, that's a hundred percent the reason. Um, I mean, even the challenge for you is name a late model German car right now that is not turbocharged. It's yeah. the rare German model, you know, whether you're starting with Volkswagen product, Audi product, Mercedes Benz, BMW, almost across the board, they've all gone small displacement and turbo. I mean, yeah. one of the challenges you think about a manufacturer like Porsche has that's unique versus, say, someone like Toyota is that to get corporate average fuel economy up, you can't do that by selling a Prius, right? Yeah. Porsche doesn't have a mileage model, right. right? So they have to get their, their corporate average to a reasonable number across the spectrum of all the cars they sell. So, I mean, it sort of forces their hand to do things like the turbocharged 991.2 yeah. and the 718 four-cylinder cars, which for the record, I think are great too. So yeah. um, I don't have a beef with it. Uh, but us Porsche purists, we do love a good traditional flat six. Yeah, but I, but I yeah. think also, you know, this fifteen, you know, the, this iteration of the naturally aspirated motor, like they've been doing this for decades with these naturally aspirated motors, and I think they probably got to the very very top of how much more you can extract, unless you get into like the GT series cars, right? So you introduce turbos, and then all of a sudden you have at least the same amount of power. But what I do love about the new turbo power plants is that they can turn the wick up on those motors with like software changes and they can change the personalities of the car and they can tone things down when you need to, you know, when you're regulated by, you know, emissions and stuff like that. So I think the power plant has a lot more flexibility, but also probably packs more punch. Yeah. And to Nathan's point earlier, they did get the efficiency part down. I mean, not that this is what we drive our cars for, but I think it's possible to see 30 miles to the gallon or even slightly more on the highway in a, in a uh, 991.2. Yeah. Yeah. I think the other thing, Boo, is, is if you think about it, as the whole market of other cars, non-Porsche has gone turbocharged, the advantage of a small displacement turbocharged motor is low-end torque. And so people that... You know, they're coming out of a 3 Series BMW or an Audi A4, A6. They're used to that feel of that low uh, RPM sort of shove you get with a turbocharged mm -hmm. motor. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, if you take a 991.1 base car, particularly with a 7-speed manual, that is not a particularly torquey car with that 3.4. And so it's very much a rev car, which I love and appreciate because that's my heritage. I come from rev cars. Mm -hmm. But the average consumer today... They're not coming from rev cars. And so, you know, a 991 base doesn't get particularly interesting until you hit north of 4,000 RPM, which is a fun place to spend some time because it sounds so darn good. Uh, but if, you, if you're driving, for example, a, a manual one and down the freeway at 2,000 RPM and you want to squirt in traffic, if you stomp the loud pedal and don't drop three gears, the car's right. not going anywhere particularly quickly. Mm -hmm. And so for some consumers, they'll say, oh, man, this car doesn't feel as fast, you know, as I thought it might. Um Whereas like the PDK will mask some of that because the PDK, if you stomp on the lap pedal, it'll drop three gears instantaneously, right? And put the car right in its power band. Yeah. So um, I would argue that a 991.1 for most consumers will feel uh, adequately powerful in a PDK. But mm -hmm. for the average person who, I hate to say it, shifts at 3,000 or 3,500 RPM, the manual transmission car will feel a little bit sluggish. It's absolutely not. They're mm -hmm. just driving it wrong. They're just driving it wrong, yeah. Yeah. So, so let's, you mentioned a little bit about the market. Um, you know, John, like I said earlier, he bought it in 2016, and they were quite plentiful back then. Um, let's talk about today's market on these 991.1s. Are is this the next great buy? Ooh, Rob? that's a good question. Uh, yeah. Rob, can give me your opinion on if it's a great buy or not. Uh, I think so. I mean, a couple, about a month and a half ago, I, I wrote an article talking about that. And at that time, it was still possible to find, you know, like a 2012 or 2013 PDK cab with some miles on it for under $50,000. And I'm just not seeing those cars anymore. It seems like the absolute rock bottom now is, at least the asking prices, is somewhere in the low 50s. So 
I think the word's gotten out. Um, and, you know, I think that, strangely enough, the, the delta between um, certain 997 models and, and 991s had gotten small enough that the people were saying, hey, what's going on? These cars really look like strong buys right now. So um, it seems like the word's out. You know, Nathan, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, there's, there's a couple things at play. Um, the biggest thing right now in the Porsche market is really just the overall car market. They came out with inflation numbers today yeah. that basically said the overall used car market year over year is up 21%. So that's wow. whether we're talking Honda, Toyota, Ford. Just yeah. cars so in general. That's cars in general, wow. right? So uh, it has made things crazy. I mean, there's things where, for example, you know, people are paying, you know, MSRP for three-year-old Toyota Tundras. I mean, so so the market overall is, is very strange right now. So we, we have yeah. to keep that in mind. I think what happens, these cars are actually following the traditional trajectory that I've seen over the last 30 years with Porsche, which is kind of the following. There, there's a certain segment of our population that they're simply new car buyers, right? Mm -hmm. And we love those people because they allow us value buyers to come in, right? So those people, they aren't going to look for a 991.1. They're going to buy a new 992. They're going to pick it up, and that's going to be our used car of the future. And then there's a the next person in line is kind of a value buyer, right? The person that they have to get below a certain number before they jump into the market. Um, and so those value buyers are either buying CPO 992s or 991.2. Um, and then your more entry-level late model buyers are the ones looking at uh, 991s. Uh, they used to be looking at 997s, but they've kind of moved out of 997s for a couple of reasons. One, there's a lot of scares about 997.1 and bore scoring and IMS. There's that. There's a lot of demand for .2 997s, and there's very little inventory because of the economy at that time. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of this perfect storm. It's pushing those buyers into the 991.1, um, and you're also pushing getting the value buyers that are saying, hey, I want to have a 911 experience. I want it late model enough. I'm not having a lot of problems with it. So there, that the perfect sort of Goldilocks car is – an early 991 um, yeah. and they're not old enough yet to be you know, classic or collectible per se which we're just starting to see now for example on the 996s are kind of hitting their stride mm -hmm. as viewed as a classic which is seems odd to say but it's well they happening. entered the so, porsche classic portfolio as a classic officially yeah. back in ag yeah. so yeah. Um, yeah so what what do you think the price range is today for for 991.1s well, the one thing to know about these cars is they made so many variants that it's hard to keep them straight. But the basic thing uh, is Coupe, Cabriolet, and Targas, um, Base Carrera, S, GTS, 4, and 4S, and 4 GTS, and Turbo, and Turbo S. And I'm sure yeah. I'm forgetting one. So you, you, it's hard to say There's so exactly, many of them, yeah. but, but basically the earliest cars, the 12 and a half introduction cars and 13 those cars, the Cabriolets trade at a discount. Um, although, interestingly enough, they, the Cabriolets do not trade at as big of a discount. As 997s as, or 996s. That was going to be it, my question it, for you. Yeah. And here's exactly why. The 991, here's one I will absolutely give my kudos to Porsche. The convertible top, and I am an avowed non-convertible guy. The convertible top on a 991 is flat, dead, sexy. Um, it's got aluminum skinned panels underneath the fabric. It's aluminum skin. And so I wish we had this top up and you could see the profile on this car mirrors that of a coupe uh, yeah. and it's rigid and it just looks amazing and it stows nice. So I we think we can it, make that happen. Let me just, while, while you're talking about that, we'll get someone to put the top up. John, can you come out and put the top up? Sorry, keep um, going so while he do that. Don't suffer the same uh, hit that they did, particularly like air cooled cabriolets, I think suffer a big hit because they're such an aesthetic derivation from the coupe, um, whereas the 991 follows the same silhouette. So that's my opinion. Of course, it's worth what you're paying for it, but I think that does hold true. There we go. Easy peasy. Yep. Yeah, so if you notice when this top is actually fully stowed, you cannot see the roof bows because they're not the traditional roof bows. See how flat that roof panel is? And it, yeah. and it comes back and it, it just maintains such a great silhouette on the car. Absolutely. Uh, that rear yeah. window is like you're flat in the back. It's very well executed. All right, John, you can throw it back for us. Thank you. 
and it's so easy to use. And I believe this, um, you can put it back down if you want, John. Um, I believe you can even put these while you're moving a certain mile an hour, right? That you can open the top, like up to 35 miles an hour. Nice. Yeah. So when you roll at the stop sign and it's, you know, starts raining, you throw it up, or if it sunshine opens up at a stoplight, you can throw it down real quickly. So definitely yeah. a nice usable cabriolet. Nathan, what about the split between PDK and manual with 991.2s? Um, uh, it seems like the take rate for manuals just absolutely plummeted with uh, with the 991. Um, you know, just anecdotally, it seems like the mix for 997 was probably, you know, 40% manual, 60% um, uh, obviously uh, Tiptronic for the dot ones and PDK for the dot twos, but it seems like it's maybe 10 or 15% manual with 991s. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on, on that in terms of, of value? Yeah, I think you're about right. Obviously, the take rate on Tiptronics and the dot one was fairly low because that, tra that transmission is limited. But the PDK was so universally accepted both in the popular press, the enthusiast yeah. press, and among the buyers that the take rate was, was great. And by the time the 991 came out, it had been on the ground for four years, and people were very comfortable with that choice. So I would actually argue the take rate on 991.1, uh, particularly just the regular models, is likely somewhere in the 80 to 85 percent range. Yeah. Yeah. I think that there's a couple of reasons for that. I mean, one, the overall car market has moved. You know, 98 percent of new cars sold uh, only have two pedals. So I think that's a reflection of that. But frankly, the PDK is such an unbelievably great transmission. Yeah. Um, and I am an avowed three pedal guy. I was actually trying to think if I own a two pedal Porsche and I, I guess I have a Cayenne. I guess that counts, right? Yeah. Um, but I will say the 991 seven speed cars are the least compelling of the 911 manual cars to me because the seven speed is just a little janky with how it ships. In my, in my view, it's actually the same transmission as a PDK. Um, and the layout of the rising central console, to me, doesn't fall to hand as naturally as the more traditional console of the earlier cars. Um, and then you couple that with the smaller displacement, particularly in the base car. So for me, if I was going to have a base 991.1, it would be a PDK. So, so I picked up on something that you said there. The manual transmission in a 991.1 is it it's not like the manual that's in say the 992 like the the transmission is still a pdk transmission but you're shifting it manually like how, what i don't fully understand there yeah so i mean basically it, believe it or not like if you for example buy a i guess the only nine uh when we think about this this is true make sure i make my statement right the only 991.1 that actually got a true uh, six-speed manual was the 911R. Uh, okay. The other yeah. one, yes, uses basically the same gearbox as the PDK, all right? So the same gear ratios and all that. Um, so because you add that extra um, kind of gate to get over to seventh, mm -hmm. I just find them kind of clunky in use. I mean, not mm -hmm. terribly so. I'm probably splitting hairs. I mean, it's still right. a Porsche. It's amazing. But um, if you, for example... I much prefer to drive a 981 six-speed manual than a nine, which would of course be the Boxster or Cayman, mm -hmm. than a 991 seven-speed manual car. Um, gotcha. Sometimes having more gears isn't better, <laughs> believe it yeah. or not. Yeah. So I think we've got some winners uh, for the raffle. So thank you for um, putting your name and where you're from. Let's see the, who the winners are. Robert. Carrie Myers from the Sun Coast region and Ed Steverson from the Bluegrass region. So Carrie, you've won the Sunshade and Ed, you've won the Jacks. So make sure you reach out to us and we will coordinate and get those shipped out to you. Congratulations to both of you. Let's talk about uh, one of our favorite Porsche celebrities uh, and you've probably watched him drift a few cars around the circuit, Porsches more specifically, and that's Chris Harris. And he, um, you know, I, I remember he made a couple of statements when he first uh, drove the 991. And I want to throw it up here and just between the three of us, talk about what he said and whether or not we agree. So, Robert, do we have a, a slide of what Chris Harris said about the car? 
Okay, so his choice, uh, let's see. So this is Walter Roll's choice. And is this what Chris Harris said? I'm just making sure. Okay, so, so he's saying he would take a, um, if you can pull, zoom out, there you go. So he's saying, Chris said he prefers the PDK over the manual. Uh, which is what I think um, Nathan just said. And then he would say he would always, um, let's see, suggest that the two-wheel drive car moves around a bit more and is more fun versus the four-wheel drive version. And he also always says the bigger engine. So would you guys agree with that? Um, well, real quick, you're reading Walter's comments there. You actually were actually saying the opposite of him. Walter was actually saying he prefers the four wheel drive small engine. Car. Oh, okay. Read his Wrong quote. side. He Sorry. Was, yeah, it yeah. is live. Oh, no, no worries. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think Chris's point is that there's a wide variety of 991s, and uh -huh. he would pick a different one depending on the situation. So I think what he was saying is for an everyday car, which I would absolutely agree with, a Carrera S PDK. Mm -hmm. um, for a road trip car, a turbo, and for sort of a track weapon, a GT3, right? So he's being, you know, pick the yeah. right uh, tool for the job. Yeah. But I think universally, I think one of the things you can gather there for the vast majority of people, the, the best one, I think, for just everyday usability is your, your basic 991 Carrera S. Uh, I would probably personally say the GTS is sort of the beautiful sweet spot. The problem with that is I'm going to tell the world that, and there's probably only a few hundred of those cars extant, so everyone's already fighting for those. So right. uh, don't forget the asses. 98% yeah. is great. So Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess if I were to choose, uh, you know, having, having just been, I guess my cars are, I don't own a PDK car, and when I go to an autocross or I go to the track and I'm trying to keep up with PDK cars, like I really would love for my next car to be a PDK car, um, sport exhaust, and you know, if possible, a GTS. Like that's, that, that is what my pick would be, for sure. And I know Rob is probably gonna pick a manual, let me just guess. Honestly, I'm not. I mean, I was really what? tempted to Who say- Who are you? <laughs> Carrera manual, but I've got to. I love the GTSs, but I've I've got to go with what Nathan, Nathan said uh, earlier. Is is an SPDK? I mean, uh -huh. is it is your one and only car? Is it is a daily? It's it's close to perfect. It's it's really good. Um, you know, one thing that we didn't mention with the wheelbase stretch is those back seats get a little bit more usable. Um, you know, if you have kids, um, you know, they they really are usable almost you know into you know teen years unless you know unless your kids are really big yeah yeah for the record i think rob only about five seven so i think his kids might be <laughs> his, kids, <laughs> his kids <laughs> wow there's no danger of kids being live on the show we crush on rob um <laughs> all right so so let's talk about what can go wrong with these cars? Um, we reached out to Peter Smith, our go-to uh, go Goldmeister tech out of California, and he gave us a, a um, basically, he says these things are built like, you know, they're, they're fantastic. Um, there's, there's minor things um, and kind of everyday things that could possibly go wrong with them. And so I'm just gonna run through the list and you guys um, chime in, but water pump yeah, the leakage, I mean, that's, you know, a 10 year old car, five year old car, water pump is a water pump. That's, that's not shocking. Uh, deck lid shocks. I don't know why, but, but deck lid shocks on most Porsches for some reason don't last very long. Um, here's, here's one, the rear spoiler wiring harness can go bad. Um, that's probably not too terrible of a fix, but I didn't realize that that yeah, but it. the next one is a deal breaker. The windshield <laughs> washer is failing. I mean, so I'll sh I'll show you guys. Let me let me do this. This is a cool plenty feature. Plenty of cars running around on salvage titles. Oh, yeah, failed windshield washer. Windshield washer hoses. So did you guys know this? And don't make fun of me because I just learned to this. So if I'm going to open the 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 frunk of this car on my 996, 
I'd use the key fob or I would go to the door. What would you guys do? Nathan, what would you do? How do, how do you open this? On a 991? Yeah. Uh, it would depend, I guess, whether I was getting out of the car or whether I was uh, walking up to the car. So, so you don't know either. That's what you're saying. I don't know. Rob, yeah, what are I... you saying? How would you open this frunk? If I'm sitting in it, I'm going to reach with my left hand down to the little switch on the sill and pull Both it. Both of you don't know what you're talking about, so it's not only me. Check this out. Who knew? I'm just going to go magic genie. What? I, oh, the I didn't know that. Control. Did you know about that? I did not know about that. That's like totally cool. It's like a Ford Explorer tailgate. <laughs> I know. Uh, it's a Ford Explorer option that I'm gushing over. That's pretty silly. But yeah. when, when John opened it up, I'm like, wait a minute. What did you just do there? So for those of you that have owned a 991 for over a decade and all other modern cars that this is a convenience you've lived with, it's something I just found out about today. So yeah. anyways. Um, but I mean, you can still open it the conventional way. With yes, you can. But that's not... Still. Which that's I not nearly as cool. That's not nearly as cool. I will never key. use those buttons and I'll ne never use my key fob. I will always do that because that is way use cooler. The, the, the gesture. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. But I think, if I'm not mistaken, that's one of the few carryover pieces from a 997 is that little switch on the sill yeah. that opens the, the trunk. All right. So uh, the reason why I opened this hood is um, to show you where I think these are. Oh, and guess what, John? Your windshield washer hoses are also broken or disconnected so uh, we'll let the owner know so they are connected better right take there. it back to porsche for a cpo warranty repair. cpo <laughs> warranty you said your car is under warranty right john i think you need hey, to as get long your you're in there Vu, can you check the drains <laughs> i should so see this one here is connected oh no that's like the wiring harness or some sort that doesn't look like the hose but whatever that is that's not cracked so anyways just back to the list that was one of the things that uh silly things that can go wrong on a 991. Um, very few PDK failures. It's, a, it's an awesome transmission, you know, from the performance side, but, you know, after a decade from longevity and durability, looks like PDKs are, are also uh, very stout. What do you guys think about that? I'm going to disagree slightly with that, Vu. I, I think historically they have been very reliable. Uh, but now we're just starting to get into that realm that, you know, the very first PDK cars were 2009, of course, 997.2s and, and 987s. Um, and just now that these cars are getting to be 10, 12, 14 years old, we're starting to see cars with, you know, 80, 90, 100, 120,000 miles. All I'm starting to see sort of my first realm of failures. And what's concerning is not the number, it, you know, it's not a number that, that causes me a lot of panic. But because we haven't seen many failures, nobody in the aftermarket has come into that space. And so if you do happen to have a PDK failure, there is that I'm aware of, there is not anybody out there servicing or repairing them. The answer is uh, we call Germany and they send less over on nice Lufthansa and uh, your wallet is lightened by somewhere in the in the teens range. So, you know, so it's only a that would be very replace. painful. Yes, I, I think place. long term, of course, as these cars become 15, 20, 25 year old cars, someone will find a niche and they'll figure out, you know, what the issues are and they'll repair them. But as of now, I don't know that there's anyone in particular doing that. Yeah. All right. Let's um, let's you, you guys want to do a little. Uh, actually, did we hit everything on the list? Oh, um, we talked about. Oh, we talked about cars that um, do track events. Uh, 991.1s. Uh, they can kick up some gravel into the radiator fans up front and um, it can cause the actual fins of the fans to deteriorate and then that can be a problem. But I mean, well, interestingly, this, Boo, I yeah? just did this repair in my shop this week and I had you really? It. Yeah. And typically people think the issue is that you have debris coming in from the front and, and right. Porsche did provide screens and the bumpers. In this case, if you look inside the fender liner of a 991, uh, they vent back through the liner. And so with sticky rubber or a gravel road, the tires will actually fling the gravel forward mm -hmm. into, in this car's case, what had happened is gravel had gotten between the blades of the fan and the housing. And then what happened is then that the blade couldn't turn and then burned out the motor. So I put motors left and right in that car. And I think the parts were about, 400 bucks a side 
So Ooh, okay. the job itself wasn't huge, but with labor and parts, yeah. you know, it was twelve or thirteen hundred dollars to replace both of them. So was the bumper was cover crazy. easy to take off, like a a nine nine six nine nine seven? Pretty really simple. easy. Real yeah. easy, like six 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 bolts or whatever. They're designed right. to come off. So since we're done with that list, do you guys want to take a quick walk around on this car and maybe if you, what you would look at if you were considering to buy this car and then we'll get into the options and special editions? Sure. All right, so dark metallic uh, blue. This car has uh, paint protection film as well as has been ceramic coated. And um, I think it has like 40 some 50,000 miles. It looks fantastic. Um, any areas of concern up front with lights or grills or anything like that that you'd be looking for? Yeah, so, I mean, a couple things. You know, sometimes we get into these segments and we talk about the problems. So I, I want to make the blanket statement that actually what I tell people when I talk about these cars is universally the 991 and, and its sister counterpart 981 cars I think are actually the most reliable generation of Porsche 911 ever built. Because um, almost every generation I can list off you know, the 10 or 20 things that are known to be failure points. And these cars, the list is actually really small. So I do want to give people the overall impression they are they're mm -hmm. really amazingly good cars. Uh, if Damon can go back to the headlights, though. Headlights, one of the if known, you would, Damon. One of the known defects on these cars is headlight delamination. And it's it's a strange one because we don't all agree as to what causes it. But if you zoom in around the edge, around the usually edge. In, that, in that silver area, You'll actually see some cracking. Oh, like around uh, this here? car looks, yeah, this mm -hmm. car looks amazingly good. But you'll yeah. see like these little micro cracks, and mm -hmm. they start as like a, a, they look almost like a relief cut at first, mm -hmm. and they'll start cracking around the edge, um, and then they'll get this really mottled appearance to it. And there doesn't seem to be rhyme or reason about the failure. Some people think it was impact, but it doesn't seem to be impact. It doesn't seem to be related to treatment because I've seen it on garage clean cars and I've seen it on, um, you know, kind of ratty drivers. Mm -hmm. I've seen it on cars that have clear film and don't. You know, some people said, oh, the clear film trapped the heat and that caused the problem. But I've seen it in both scenarios. There's a lot of debate about it. If you caught it early enough, Porsche would have covered it under warranty. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, now most of these cars are now out of, out warranty. of warranty. Yeah. Well, this and one's in so, good shape. So lucky yeah, for John. So lucky yeah. but yeah look for that inspect the headlights really closely and there is no aftermarket answer that i think is acceptable so you're stuck replacing the entire housings for a couple thousand bucks a piece yeah yeah, yeah. now talk yeah, about I, uh oh, go ahead robert oh robert. no i agree with nathan i think these cars are insanely well built you know all the little minor things that might happen with a 997 or even a 996 like headlight switches ignition switches um, you know, even the trim items on the, you know, on the, the lighter interiors where they get nicked up around the ignition switch and the window switches and things like that. I just, I, I don't see those with 991s. Uh, they just mm -hmm. seem to hold up really, really well. I'm standing in front of the front wheels and brakes. Um, wheel, tire, brake combo. Any thoughts on those for a 991? Here is standard brakes. And the S would have had bigger brakes. And then you have the potential ceramic brakes, right? Correct. All right. Then we move into the interior. Oh, so this color combination, um, it's a handsome car, dark blue over tan. What really jumps out at me, this is a fairly light color tan. And I believe maybe one of you know the details of it, but I believe Porsche had a campaign that because the dash was so reflection. light reflection there was glare in the glass and they actually gave people i think they covered if you like i don't know sunglasses or you would spend up to 250 dollars to send you a pair of polarized sunglasses which mm -hmm, mm -hmm. again is kind of comical kinda funny, so but in 40 years from now at some concour event some judge will say well do you have your porsche authorized <laughs> polarized sunglasses <laughs> yeah. yeah and they they will be worth 500 dollars. so yes. yeah the Class action lawyers, I'm sure, made out like bandits and yes. the plaintiffs got... But I remember stuff. reading that and going, huh, I guess that's one way to solve it is issue people sunglasses. Um, the interior of yeah. this car is just incredibly handsome. This has uh, the ventilated seats, so heating and cooling, um, you know, probably one of the greatest things to, to have in a cab. 
And then the light color interior, it, it, you're right, Rob, this car, you know, as far as wear and tear, it's, it's in amazing shape. Yeah, it really is. Now, hey, Nathan, is it my imagination or did colors get a little bit more sedate from the 997 to the 991 era? I mean, it just seems like, um, you know, some of the, uh, I mean, I guess you get lava orange in a, in a 991, but it, it just seems like, it, you know, the pendulum swung back to, you know, a lot of gray, silvers, blacks, whites. This car is, is unusual. I think absolutely gorgeous uh, in, in its colors, but it just seems like... Um, you know, 991, 991 colors got a bit more conservative. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because 997.1 was pretty conservative. And then in dot two, they came out with a little bit crazier couple colors like yeah. Impanema the Blue and Malachite the racing green, green, Racing Green. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then I with mean, the 991.1, they were pretty conservative. I mean, really, the only color I think that's kind of out there is the Lime Gold Metallic. Lime Gold. Yeah, I mean, cognac is not exactly a you know a, a crazy bright color, but it's really handsome and it's yeah, kind it's of odd, color. unusual. It stands out when you see it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just something that that uh, I, I noticed. So, so Damon, a... you're focused on something we want to we want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Look at the top of the door panel for a second. Like, look at the top of the door from panel. The outside of the car. Top of the door panel from the outside. You said. Yeah, kind of get eye level with it. Eye level with the t uh, top of the, the door panel. Okay, so uh -huh. see how that dot panel, you can just start to see it on this car. See how it's pulling away there? Oh, see that yeah. gap? That gap, yeah. So that's one of the other known issues with these cars, and it only affects the cars or primarily affects the cars that um, have partial leather. So this is one good reason to have a full leather car, but see how it's pulling out of there? Mm -hmm. What happens is the glue that Porsche used was some sort of um, EU approved. We don't harm, you know, native degradable glue, and yeah. it does pull it up. And so the the panel starts to the material pull pulls away from the actual uh, panel. Yeah, right here. Yeah, this look pretty good. This is pretty um, good, but you can see that it is pulling away a little bit. John's yeah. going to regret bringing his car here because I I pointed out dings to him and I pointed out scratches, and now I'm pointing out panels that are pulling apart. I'm sorry, John. I didn't mean to do this to you. So we're, we're, we're looking at the interior, and I see the Sport Chrono and the Sport Plus button, and I think we have to kind of address that because there is this thing called uh, a stop sale with vehicles um, at dealerships where they can't sell uh, these cars that have the Sport Plus. And so I guess um, what I know about it is if you own, John, you own this car as an owner, enjoy it. it means nothing to you you could sell this car to a dealer you could sell it to an individual um, but the regulators i think with the hyper focus from all the vw stuff like the sport plus button um, they're working with the regulators to i guess understand what that may or may not change in terms of vehicle emissions so that's why these vehicles aren't being sold at dealers but everywhere else they're still being sold um, Rob yeah. and to clarify, they're not being else? sold at Porsche. They're not being sold at Porsche franchise dealers. Franchise right. dealers, um, yes. And right. that's not because legally they can't. That was Porsche corporate made a decision to hold off on selling those cars until they have the appropriate answer. So, exactly. if anything, what that has done, that's one of the reasons the market's stronger. Because if you take every franchise Porsche dealer in North America and not allow them to sell any 991 with a PDK, mm -hmm. frankly, that probably takes out. I don't know, 70 plus percent of the available inventory. It just leaves oh, private right. parties and right. independent dealers, yeah. right? So right. now you have an inventory shortage. So Yeah, and so now you can command a premium. <laughs> yep. All right, moving towards the back. Um, I think the really only big decision back here is non, non S or S, and depending on what you're using the car for and uh, maybe your, your check, checking account, right? Well, and the best thing about a 991, if you like Concor, you don't have to clean your engine because all you open the engine compartment, all you see is a silly fan and a place to add oil. <laughs> right. The first, yeah, the 997 was the last one where you could actually lift the rear boot and see the complete engine. This one, you lift up and Such see. Such as two. it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So that was the quick walk around. I don't know if there's any questions. I didn't look at my phone. I apologize if you guys are asking stuff on 
the live chat and I haven't gotten to it. But know that uh, any question that goes unanswered on the live chat area, um, we will go back and pull all those questions and we'll answer them and we will post them. And um, so don't worry about that. Let's talk about options. We do have an options list, right? I think Robert's gonna throw it up here. So popular options, okay, uh, PDK, or seven speed manual, sport design steering wheel with paddles, sport chrono, uh, sport exhaust, um, Porsche active suspension management or PASM, and then adjustable seats. Uh, how about you guys on this list? You check everything or one thing is a must have or, or what are your thoughts on these options? Well, it depends on your configuration and your goal. Uh, I mean, a couple things. So if you order a PDK, in my opinion, you, you absolutely have to have Sport Chrono because it unlocks the better shifting algorithms uh, by using Sport Chrono or Sport and Sport Plus mode. So I think that's mandatory. Whereas in a manual, I think the Sport Chrono is about worthless. So I would, I'd, if I had a manual, it would be non-Sport Chrono. Okay. Um, sport Exhaust, in my view, is pretty necessary unless you want to go with something aftermarket. But if you want to go factory... If it sounds glorious, frankly, I love sport um, Porsche sport exhaust. Oh, yes, yeah. Um, you know, seats are you know, everyone's got an opinion on them. Um, sometimes I think having 18 ways to adjust a car, I mean, the funny thing is, I have 18 ways, and uh, I think just maybe in my Cayenne or something, and I can't remember how often I actually adjust them. I literally get it set, and that's it. So you, go, you, go, you go up, yeah. down, up, yeah. down, and back and forth for your 18 yeah, ways. I mean, but. <laughs> each their own right yeah. i mean i think the thing to know with the 991 is it really did usher in the era where porsche really went over the top i mean the option list i mean a joke is about 72 pages long you know the first you know three or four pages are, are substantive and the rest is you know leather covered this and deviated stitch that and you know if you're not careful you could add 60 70 80 thousand dollars worth of options to one of these cars so it's mm -hmm. kind of amazing one, one option that's not on there is uh, ceramic brakes. Would you be a yay or a nay on ceramic brakes? Me personally, I love ceramic brakes. And the reason I love them, it's the stupidest reason. And I would pay for them just for this reason alone. The wheels never get dirty. It's uh. a glorious thing. <laughs> for a person who's OCD. I mean, Mr. Concord, Mr. Concord. Oh, when you drive a yes. normal Porsche, you literally pull it out of the garage and you make one stop. You know, and that the brakes are back, or the wheels are back. Drives me crazy. Right, right. Rob, yeah. you would you would opt for the ceramics uh, for the same reason, and I'm nowhere near as, as you know as, as OCD as Nathan. But I just literally experienced the same thing today. I mean, I literally did my wheels two days ago, and they're they're black again. Okay, so yeah, being a, cheap as I I am probably notorious for. So if you're buying a 991, that might be you know, anywhere between five years to 10 years old on ceramics. Like, do you want to be the one caught holding the hot the... potato? I don't want to be caught with the hot potato because it's kind of expensive, isn't it? Right. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of wheel cleaner that, that uh, you, you'd have to save. I'm on just, I'm, I'm just sharing with you the way that I think about it. That's all. I'm not saying yeah. that they're bad. And they definitely are, do stay clean, but it does scare me a little bit if I'm the one having to swap out and put on a new set of ceramics. Does anybody yeah, know the what key the, there the is in is? What was that? Ooh. Does anyone know the approximate cost of, of replacing the rotors? I don't know off the top of my head, but we can find out. I, I, if I'm yeah. not mistaken, it is like in the ten to fifteen thousand dollar range. We'll I'm use the term eye watering. Uh, yeah, eye <laughs> watering range. We'll we'll answer but that question. Pass the steering wheel is looking really good to me right now. <laughs> yeah. I, I want the leather covered fuse box. I think that is the single most important <laughs> option for any Porsche. Yeah. Because when I get in a, in a person's Porsche and they have a vinyl or heaven forbid a plastic fuse box cover, or I a judge raw them poorly yeah. as a human being. They're just yeah. not good people. <laughs> <laughs> right, so and funny. I'm the same way with with vent veins. If you know the the veins and the vents and the dash are not leather covered, yeah, I, I, I judge too. Yeah, and what about the um, the power kits and the aero kits for these cars? I don't think that was listed. Like, I, I'm an aero kit person. I love, you know, 
chin spoilers, I love big wings and wide hips and flares. I totally can dig an arrow kit. You guys? I love it on a 996. I love it on the 991. I love it on all cars. Oh. That's just me. Yeah, I'm mixed. I don't yeah. hate. All right, let's talk about special editions. Oh my gosh, we're almost at to the end of the episode. So hopefully you all are having fun watching us. I think we're still at 370-some uh, viewers, and uh, we're just hanging out talking about 991s. Uh, let's talk about some of the special editions of this uh, seventh generation 911. What do we got here? I think we've got my very oh so this is this looks like the 50th anniversary 50th anniversary yeah yeah right. with the yes. with the fuchs oh, right yep. there I love it. and that i forget yeah. the color gray that's like geyser gray or that's a it's a very unique looking color and it has the pepita interior which is geyser gray with pepita interior which is awesome now my very 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 favorite 991.1 <laughs> and i'm not just saying that because this i had a hand <laughs> i had a hand yeah. in shaping how this car came about but uh, the pca club coupe oh one of the 60 beauties that was produced by porsche for the um, porsche club of america members and we gave one away we had 59 others that uh, were available for sale to members and uh, i don't have you been tracking the the values of these nathan rob uh, you know, they've, they've held up really well. I mean, they're, they're all well into, you know, kind of six figures, right? Uh, one and a oh, quarter, easily. one and a half. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the special edition cars are sort of interesting because the 991, one other thing it ushered into is, I mean, I sort of joke, but there are so many special editions that even if you're a guru on these things, you couldn't possibly keep all of them straight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that's diluted to them a little bit in, and certain Special editions, I think, have done better than others. I think the 50th and the Club Coupe in particular have held up. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's also one of the things, like you take the Club Coupe as an example, since there was only 60 examples, it, the way it was presented into the world felt r really special. And so in some ways, the market's arbitrarily high because most owners just don't want to relinquish them. Mm -hmm. And so you'll see people advertise these things at prices, which frankly are a little challenged i guess i would put it in my view and so then they just don't sell but then if someone else yeah. wants to sell it they go well oh there's one in the market for 150 i guess I'll well i know exactly why they do that yeah. they do that so they yeah. can say honey i did try to sell it but no sell one wanted car. to buy it <laughs> it's unsellable yeah. it's unsellable so we'll just have to keep it <laughs> hopefully yeah, my wife's not, not watching because i have used that before <laughs> oh man i whew, man i gotta be careful what i say here like i know there's yeah. um the Rensport edition too, because uh, during Rensport, I think they announced like they were making 35 of them. So those are pretty rare. And I don't think I've seen the Rensport edition one really in the wild. Um, obviously I've seen club coupes at our, at our own, own events, but um, yeah. And one of them showed up on the Netflix series, House of Cards a couple of years ago, if you remember that. Yeah, so that was actually one of our um, Chesapeake region members or Potomac region members locally here that brought his car to be used in the show. So that was cool. Um, wow, I can't believe it. We're already at the top of the hour. Um, thank you everyone for, for joining in tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. Please be sure to like and subscribe. It really helps our algorithm. Um, talking about the 991 today, a decade later, it's a great buy. You heard it here first. And um, please, if you're enjoying the show, leave a comment and we'll catch you next time. Be safe. We'll see ya.